I'm Claudia Besser. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Education. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's talk by Jeffrey Valance. Um, Jeffrey is one of the artists featured in our new exhibition, Nine Lives, Visionary Artists from Los Angeles, curated by Ali Sabotnik. So Jeffrey Valance has an amazing installation in the Nine Lives show upstairs. Uh, it's a replica of a wall of his, in his home that is one of his many object collections. Um, in addition to this exhibit, he has two other concurrent shows here in California. He has one at San Diego State University Art Gallery called Animal Kind, or it's a group show, and that's up until May 6th. He's also in another group show uh, in Eagle Rock at the Center for the Arts called High Strangeness, which is all about the paranormal. Um, and as part of a celebration of the 500th birthday of the French theologian John Calvin, as in the founder of Calvinism, uh, Jeffrey has done his own illustrated version of the Bible. And that's going to be on display in Geneva this fall. It should be epic. Um, Jeffrey's from Redondo Beach and went to Cal State Northridge and Otis. His work has been shown at museums and galleries around the world, including Senegal, Iceland, Switzerland, Italy, France, Mexico, Australia, Tasmania, Sweden, England, Greece, and of course, all around the US. And Jeffrey now teaches in the new genre department here at UCLA. He's written for many publications and journals, including Art Issues, Art Forum, LA Weekly, Juxtapose, and Fortean Times. He's published five books, Blinky the Friendly Hen, The World of Jeffrey Valance, Thomas Kincaid, Heaven on Earth, which is upstairs, but I don't have a copy, um, My Life with Dick, and most recently, Relics and Reliquaries. Uh, and Jeffrey has kindly consented to do a book signing after this. So if you want to come to the bookstore upstairs after his talk, as a special incentive, this book, uh, you can have your own signed copy of My Life with Dick for just $1.49. So please come upstairs. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jeffrey Valance. OK. Uh, I'm going to talk about blinking a little bit later. But uh, we're going to go to the slideshow now so we can bring that up. OK. And uh, OK, this was in about 1985. And uh, at that time, I was traveling a lot in the South Seas. And I went to different islands. And uh, I, I kept on hearing these wild tales about Tonga, uh, this one island that I hadn't uh, been to yet. And uh, I kept on hearing that there was this huge king that lived there. And he lived in this little, little tiny palace. And he had all these weird rituals and everything. So uh, I wanted to go and meet the king. And, uh, but I had no reason to meet the king. Or, or, or I didn't know how to do it exactly. So uh, I, I started about doing research to, to try and figure out how to do it. So I, first I went to see my local politicians. And then finally uh, worked my way up to seeing the uh, mayor of uh, LA at that time, uh, Tom Bradley. And he wrote a letter to the king uh, telling him that I was coming. And, and the, the, it, it uh, just so happened to be that the, uh, Mayor Bradley was friends with the king. Anyway, uh, they kind of made it almost like this, uh, uh, like I was like some kind of official uh, representative from, from LA going to Tonga. OK, that was one thing. And then I found out. Uh, a friend of mine had made some films in Tonga, and I was uh, asking about the king. And, and he was saying that the uh, king at that time uh, weighed almost 500 pounds, and his doctor told him that he should uh, lose some weight. So his uh, doctor told him that he should, he should swim. That's a, like a very good exercise. But the king was having the problem is that he was so huge. If you look at his hands, Compared to mine, they're like twice the size. And, and it, it was the same thing with his feet, too. So he could never get the right, right size of uh, a swim fin. So uh, I went to a local dive shop, and I ordered the largest swim fins in the world. It's here. They're uh, super, super extra large. So I brought those along as a gift. So with the, with the letter from Mayor Bradley and the, and the swim fins, I uh, made it into the palace. Uh, and if you see here, the, this is like the throne room. And has, he has this uh, carved uh, throne with this Tongan uh, symbol on it. And uh, the uh, 
King is famous for lots of things, but, but two main important things. Uh, he's in the Guinness World Record as the world's fattest king, so I thought that was interesting. And also, uh, he was the only king that surfed, so I thought, you know, that's a great combination of things. So anyway, next slide. And uh, when I got back home, I ordered the same size swim fins, the super extra large, and then I painted these scenes on them, uh, one of giving the fin to the king, and then this other one, uh, I tried to imagine what the king would look like underwater. I, I didn't get to see him swim, but you know, it, was, it was just my imagination. So uh, there he is swimming. So next slide. And uh, in Tonga, I made all these different uh, paintings and sculptures and artifacts. And this one, uh, I worked with a local uh, wood carver to do, do a, a portrait of the king. And uh, also, I included the, the, the official uh, Tongan uh, coat of arms. And I tried to, when I was working with the carver, I told him that I wanted the king to wear his like, you know, official military hat, but it sort of came out more, more like a golf hat in a way, but it was still good. Okay, next. <clears throat> and then I did this exhibition later of, it's, it's sort of like my version, versions of all the, the king's like royal objects. So I had the, the royal throne here, and there's a, a, a tap of cloth, and there's, there's the symbol again. And if you look in our show uh, on the brown wall, you'll see a lot of these Tongan royal symbols that, that, that I've used up there. Okay, next slide. And then here's the whole installation. You have the throne and the crown and the orb and the scepter and the, the royal ring and then the royal uh, surfboard and, and, the, and the flag up here and then the red carpet. All right, next. And uh, this was back in the 80s, and this was where I lived. I lived in the valley, and uh, I started this process where I would go to Tonga, and then I started going, uh, I kind of had this idea, okay, I went to like tropical islands in the, in the South Pacific, and I wanted to go to some place I thought was exactly the opposite of that, so then I chose to go to Iceland. So here was like this arc, just sort of Iceland, Tonga, Iceland, Tonga, you know, not going to New York or Europe or any other place, but just going back and forth to these two, you know, polar opposites. Okay, next. And then here's, here's Iceland, here's the map of Iceland. And I'm always kind of interested in these sort of these uh, primitive carvings, these like tiki-like carvings and, and all these like mythical figures. Okay, next. And then uh, uh, I went to, I went to Iceland uh, three times, also went to Tonga three times, and uh, this was the first trip to Iceland. I was sort of doing research, so I brought a drawing pad and I did all these drawings uh, on site of like all these different artifacts and, and things I would see. And uh, at that time, I became interested in the, the, the president of Iceland, and she was also very interesting at that time. She was the first uh, woman elected uh, from a, a democratic country, uh, elected president, and also in, in Tonga, I mean in Iceland at that time, there was sort of this feminist revolution going, so it was a really inter interesting moment in uh, Iceland. Okay, next. And then I did some, uh, on my second trip, I did some uh, portraits of the president. Uh, and then these are the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the national fist. It's the, it's the cod and the herring. And that's like the, you know, one of the main uh, uh, exports from uh, Iceland. Uh, next. And there's, here's a meeting with the, the president of Iceland. And uh, so again, it's like I had to figure, you know, I had to invent some reason to meet with the president. And uh, so what had happened is on my first trip to Iceland, I, I did research. And then a couple years later, I was invited back to Iceland to have a show in, in, the, in the 
art museum. So I used that as an excuse to uh, meet, meet the president. And uh, uh, if you're interested in everything that happened on these, on these different meetings with the king and the president, all this other dialogue and everything is like written up in the uh, uh, collected writings. Oh, all right, next. And then now, this is a, a, a different topic, but this was, a, this, was this really bad uh, collage I made of Nixon in, in, in about 1974, around like Watergate era. And uh, I kind of have this theory that, that uh, almost every artist working at that time, like everyone has their Nixon piece. And, and this was my Nixon piece. And, uh, like a lot of those pieces, it wasn't very good, you know, it was kind of bad, and, and, but I save everything, so uh, later on I was like looking at it and I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what do I do with, with this thing? Do I, do I have to save it or can I get rid of it or throw it away? Uh, and then I started thinking, oh yeah, they just opened up the Richard Nixon Library out in like Yorba Linda, so I thought maybe they would want it. Uh, and I also had this other ugly thing, which I think is the next slide. This was a, it was a bronze casting I did of uh, Spiro Agnew, and it was a little bell. And uh, I had this like metal ca uh, casting class in like junior college, and I, I made the bell. And uh, the uh, teacher got mad because I was supposed to like clean up, clean up the bell, it like had all these little bubbles on it, but I left them on, it kind of looked like warts, but I wasn't supposed to do that, so I actually got, actually got, like, got like a, 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 a D in the class. But anyway, I made the Agnew Bell, so I brought the collage and the Agnew Bell down to the, the Nixon Library, hoping that they would take them off my hands, you know, because I have all this work that I did when I was a kid and younger, and it's like, you know, I save everything, so it's like hard to, you know, keep all this stuff. So I was hoping that you know it would just disappear. Anyway, I went down there and they didn't want it. It was like you know really disappointed, you know, and because I thought I would never see it again. So I was I was driving back from the Nixon Library, kind of really pissed, you know. And okay, I have to keep this thing some more. So then I was and then I got this idea. Well, I have all this other Nixon stuff. When I was a kid, I was like nuts and collected all these buttons and bumper stickers and everything. So I thought, if they won't take it, I'll just make my own Nixon museum. So uh, next slide. So here's the Nixon museum. And uh, it uh, opened up the same year that the real Nixon library opened up. And uh, this was a, a uh, installation at Rosamund Felsen Gallery. And you have these like, you have some, some found portraits and some portraits that I did, and uh, different collages and things. Uh, and then a, a whole cabinet of collectibles and uh, other weird Nixon stuff. Uh, next, next slide. And this is one of, the, one of the main things in the show. It's like a cabinet of like maybe like a thousand different Nixon things. There's, there's buttons, and there's, there's all this weird stuff. There's a, like a Halloween mask. And these are like mod sunglasses. Uh, there's a shower head, uh, little dolls. There's little er erasers of Nixon Agnew, uh, puppets, and just you know everything you could ever imagine with, with Nixon on it. Okay, next. And this is another wall with the with the uh, Nixon clothes. So you got this uh, this like. Uh, uh, dress, it's, it's, it's actually a paper dress, and then you have Nixon scarves and neckties, and then these wonderful uh, Nixon uh, polo shirts and a, and a flag. Okay, next. And then this is my version of the Nixon Library, which is like a literal library. Uh, and this kind of has a, a different... Uh, story that goes with it too. Uh, somebody bought this piece and they, and they brought it home and included with the library is Nixon trash, a little can full of trash. And what the, what the trash was, was like 
when I was doing research on the Nixon Library and everything, so I made like notes and like sketches and everything, and I wadded all that up and put it in the trash. So anyway, somebody bought that. And, and they had it in their living room, and they went on vacation, and uh, the maid actually came and emptied the Nixon trash. And they're very, very upset with that, you know, because it had all these drawings and everything in it. So then later, I sort of made uh, more Nixon trash to, to put in the trash can. Okay, next. Yeah, and here's another view looking out the door. And, uh, and this, is a, this is like a Nixon welcome mat. It was actually made by the, the artist uh, uh, Jim Iserman, and it's like a Nixon portrait. And it's right when you walk in. So you can tell like, whether somebody liked Nixon or not. If they liked Nixon, they would walk over the, the mat. And if they didn't like Nixon, they would stand there and you know, grinding their shoes into his face. All right, next. Ah, oh, this is some of the smaller Nixon pieces. This is a artificial Nixon fingernail. And uh, this is the uh, uh, traveling Nixon museum. And this was, uh, for a while, this, this piece like traveled throughout Europe and it went to Sydney, went all these different places. So I made, this is sort of like a Nixon museum in a suitcase that I could send off to like different shows. All right. Uh, and this is another, another early piece. And this is uh, exactly like that other bad uh, Nixon collage. But this was like a bad painting that I made in junior high school. And uh, at that time, I went to uh, Christ uh, Christian school. I went to Lutheran school. So this was, like, this was a painting from a Bible story. And it's supposed to be <coughs> when the, uh, Christ is tempted by the devil, and, and, and the devil takes Christ up. And, Shows them all the cities of the world, and so forth. But anyway, it was, uh, you know, like a junior high school painting, and, and uh, I was hoping to get rid of it again. You know, could I give it to someone? Could I donate it? And, and I was thinking around, okay, what is it? It's a, okay, it's a Christian painting. So I thought, you know, where could I send that? And I thought, oh, the Vatican has a, you know, a, a, a collection of Christian art. So I, th I thought. I'd, I sent it to the Vatican, you know, and then hopefully maybe I'd never see it again. So I wrapped the whole thing up, I sent it off to the Vatican collection, and I knew that either one of two things would happen. Either uh, they would keep it, which would be great because I could put it on my resume, you know, in the Vatican collection, <clears throat> or they would send it back, and that, that, would, that would be okay too because then I would have the painting that was it was a reject from the Vatican collection. So anyway, next slide. Uh, a couple months later, this big package comes back from the Vatican. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it can, it, can we go back one? Yeah. Uh, it was very impressive because uh, all art sent, sent from the Vatican has to be like sealed with this little Vatican coin uh, that I like quite a bit. OK, next slide. And this is what I thought was really important. Uh, I sent the painting to the Vatican as this bad painting, but it stays there for a while. And then it comes back as a religious article. So it somehow you know, went to the Vatican and picked up you know, more sacredness and became more holy and became this like, religious object when it, when it came back. All right, next. And then. Uh, I started doing these different paintings that kind of evolve on these two stories that you probably know about. One is the Shroud of Turin, which I believe most everyone knows about, which is a full body print of Christ. But there's also this other relic, which is the, it's called the Veronica's Veil. And it's similar to the Shroud, but it's just, it's just the facial imprint of Christ. And there's a little story that goes with it that uh, Christ was carrying the crossed to Calvary, and this woman ran up and wiped his face because it was all s sweaty and bloody. And as he looked at the cloth, then there was this miracle portrait of Christ on the cloth. So anyway, I was sort of messing around with this idea and making these different drawings. And then th this is how weird things happen, was right in the middle of this, I get this call like out of the blue 
from uh, Turin, I Italy, from this uh, gallery in Turin, Italy that, that has this castle up in the hills. It has kind of like this artist's uh, retreat. And they, they asked me if I would come there you know, during the summer and do a project. So I thought, perfect. Turin, the shot of Turin, so, so, so I went. Uh, next. So I did research on the Shroud of Turin. And uh, I want to tell you what I found. OK. First of all, I bought like about, I don't know, like, like 20 books on the Shroud of Turin and looked at them all and tried to figure out what people were doing research on. And of course, you know, everyone's very concerned about the print of Christ, which you see here, the head and the arms and the legs as the back of his head and his bottom and the, and the bottom of his feet. Uh, but there are these other weird stains here, these very dark ones, and nobody really talked about those very much because they, they were actually formed later when somebody, uh, somebody tried to burn the shroud, but the shroud didn't totally burn uh, because it was, it was like folded up very small, like kind of into a hanky, and like one corner burned, but then when they unfolded it, you know, the burn went uh, all the way across all this entire section, so it opened up. So people weren't so interested in looking in that because that happened later. But I started looking in here, and I started to see what I thought were these weird faces. And uh, at first, I wasn't sure what they were, but I kept on looking at them. And then it dawned on me, they kind of look like clowns. But it didn't make any sense, you know, because I want things to make sense. And like, what, you know, why would clowns be, be on the Shroud of Turin? And, and for a while, I was kind of confused. OK, next slide. And that's a, another detail. I hope you can kind of see. Uh, what I'm talking about. If you're really interested, get, get a book on the shroud, and you, you can you know, open it up, and you can, you can see these. Uh, so I started doing research on, on clowns. And when I did my research on clowns, I realized that uh, in the Middle Ages, clowns were very different. Clowns, clowns in, the, in the Middle Ages were more like uh, devil characters, and then over time they sort of evolved into being uh, more friendly. OK, next. And here's uh, some details of, of the different clowns. And these are, these are uh, redrawn, but they're almost exactly uh, like the ones on the shroud. And it has these really weird details. Like you can see the, uh, the nose with a little highlight, highlight, and there's a little hat with a highlight you know, and the, the clown makeup. And it has these, the, the, these are actually patches on the shroud that burned all the way through. But I interpret these as like big uh, clown collars. OK, next. Uh, and that's a different one. And you know, again, it was the same pattern that repeated over, over and over again. So they're, they're, they're almost the same. Uh, this one's very similar. So this one kind of has some uh, teeth. All right, next. Uh, this one sort of I interpret as like a like a screaming clown. Uh, you see his mouth way open. Okay, next. Then this is kind of a owlish kind of clown uh, sticking his tongue out, and you have the big clown collars. Uh, now I want you to, to to look in this area. Now this. This is sort of this drippy area, and it's not from the burn mark. It's not a scorch mark. This is, this is an actual marking that was on the shroud before it got burned. And what this represents, it's, it's supposed to represent uh, when, when Christ was on the cross, the Roman guard came up and, and stuck the spear in his side. And this is supposed to represent the blood that flowed out. And uh, I looked in here, and I thought, that I saw this uh, portrait. OK, next. And this is a, a blow up of it. And uh, so I was looking at it. And again, I wasn't, sure, wasn't quite sure who it was. And then the more I looked at it, the more I realized it looks like George Washington. But, the, the, but that didn't make any sense either. 
you know, because he's a, from a whole different era, you know, actually uh, after the shroud was made, you know, so, but I did my research, and uh, next, next slide, uh, and here's the actual stain, and then here's, here's this, it, it, it's the famous bust by the French artist uh, Udon, and uh, it's also the image that's, that's used for the, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, quarter, so if you look in a quarter, that's the image that's on there. So, you know, at first it was almost like a joke, you know, like, oh, ha, ha, I found George Washington. And then the more research I did, the more I realized, no, wait a minute, it is George Washington. It's exactly like George Washington. And if you look, you see all these details, like you see, you see his forehead and like eyebrows. You can even see a little eye in there, obviously the nose, and you can see the lips. And here's this like colonial hairstyle. If you look on the quarter, it's kind of like this little bun that they would have. And, uh, and it even has like the neck muscles, very similar to this. So, so in a while I, in a, for a while, I was kind of like freaked out, like, hey, wait a minute, this really is George Washington. Okay, next. Uh, and then uh, about this time, I was, I was looking on the internet and I found this, this Catholic site that had my name on it. And I was going, okay, what are they doing? Then I realized that uh, I got included in this book that they publish every year. And it's, and it's this collection of uh, anti-Catholic artists. And like different people are in there, Mike Kelly and other people. And, and, I, and I said, wait a minute, what, what am I doing in this book? So I, I ordered a copy of the book and I read this little thing that they wrote on on me uh, and realized that they had really gotten it wrong because I read the little thing and they said okay there was an artist there was an artist that put clowns on the Shroud of Turin and I thought that's not correct I didn't put clowns on the Shroud of Turin so uh, uh, I wrote the I wrote the uh, 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 director of the Catholic Le League uh, William Donahue and, and told them, you know, exactly what happened. And I had this theory, you know, that I explained to them. I said, I said, no, you guys got it wrong. I, I didn't put the clowns on the shroud. I just found them on the shroud. And then I told them my theory. I told them, okay, what I think it happened is like somebody tried to burn the shroud. And uh, if this is the real shroud of Christ, the real relic, who would want to burn the evidence? Obviously, the devil would want to burn the evidence. But the devil uh, failed. And he, he only managed to sort of burn these like horrible like self-portraits in, in, in onto the shroud. And if you, if you research, like I said, clowns and, and go back in the Middle Ages, actually clowns evolved from devils. So, so it's actually like this diabolical self-portraits of the devil on the shroud. Anyway, I explained this all to Mr. Donahue. <clears throat> and I got this nice letter back from him. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. I totally understand what you're talking about. And we'll, we'll take your name off the list. <laughs> so I really like that quite a bit. All right, next. And then now here's a uh, totally different piece. And this, I was invited to be in this show in, in Houston. It was like an insulation show, and you could do whatever you wanted. And I came up with this idea that I would uh, make this office. Uh, and, and this office was like right in the window uh, of, the, of the art space. So like when you like walk by, you'd look in, and it almost looked like everything was gone. Like, you know, like somebody had sold the gallery, and then there was this horrible office in there. Uh, next slide. And uh, so there, there was these picture windows. So you'd look in, and there would be this office. And uh, so it, it, was, it was like this performance piece. And I was there for a month. So every day, I would go into the office and just sit, sit at the desk. And uh, I had them hook up a, a live phone. Then I had a, you know, a, a wa water thing. And I had a coffee pot. I'd make fresh coffee every morning. And, and uh, you know, I'd write letters and stuff. And uh, 
in the beginning, it was totally pointless. Like, I really had nothing to do. I would just kind of come in and go through the motions. And then uh, there was an article in the newspaper that talked about the office, and they put my phone number. So I started getting these calls. And people, people wanted to come in. So I said, OK. And I got an appointment book and started to write down people's names. And people kind of trickled in. And then over time, uh, more and more people came like all day long. So I had to like mark them in. And there was like a little waiting room. The waiting room was like full, and people would come. And then after a while, it became like really exhausting, you know? And I'd talk to people like all day long, you know, and then, and then I would go home and, and, and it'd be like, oh God, I'm so glad I'm out of the office. And, you know, and so like this like fake thing, like over time, it became almost like this real job. Okay, next. And that's like another, another view. There was like the waiting room uh, out there. But it kind of has, a, you know, it was, it was in Texas, so I tried to, tried to have this Texas flavor. There's like cowboy hats and, and, and different things, uh, Texas elements. OK, next. And then uh, people really liked the office piece. And then they, they asked me to do it several times. So I did it a few times. And then, of course, I got sick of it. And they wanted to do something different. And uh, the uh, people at Lace, the old Lace that was in downtown, wanted me to do the office. And I said, well, I don't want to do it. I want to do something different. So I looked around, and I came up with this idea that uh, what I would do is I would just uh, uh, walk around the gallery, and then I would cut these holes all the way through the wall. And then they would just go into these these little rooms, almost like the office, but they were sort of these, these existing rooms. So this was like looking into, like the, into the janitor's closet. And uh, it had these gold frames, and it had glass on it. So when you, when you first walked in, you, you know, and you were standing back, you, you didn't know what it was. Was it a photograph, or is it a little model, or is it a painting? And then you go up to it, and you realize, no, I'm just looking through the wall. And, uh, it kind of had some activity because the janitor would come in there and you know get some buckets and so it was almost like a little show in a way. Uh, next slide. And then this was looking into the electrical room uh, and it has all the tools hanging up and everything. Uh, next. And this was looking into the, uh, the storage closet in the bookstore. So there was some activity when people would go in there and get books and papers and things. And next, this was uh, looking into this uh, elevator shaft. That was kind of scary. You'd see this elevator slowly going up. And it was kind of dark in there. All right, next slide. Uh, and then I moved to Las Vegas uh, back in the mid-'90s. And uh, when I first moved to Vegas at that time, there, there wasn't an art scene. Actually, there, there was like no, no art museums or, or any place to show work. But there were all these funky museums. There was a clown museum and a Liberace museum and a magic museum. So uh, one by one, I approached each of the museums and asked them if I could curate these shows within the galleries, I mean, within the museums. So this was one of the first ones. And this was in the Las Vegas uh, Clown Museum. And if you. If you look here, uh, these are the clowns of Turn, but just sort of, sort of more uh, colorful versions of them. And uh, the one thing I liked about the museums in Las Vegas is there was no place to show any art. Like the walls are completely covered with stuff. So I kind of had to evolve this way of like putting everything on easels, like in front of other things. And, uh, I like that because it really became confusing. And you had to sort of block other images. And then also, when you came in, you like couldn't tell where the art show started and where it ended. You know, it's just like you like didn't know what was going on. OK, next. Uh, this was the one at the, at the Debbie Reynolds Hotel Casino Museum. And it's the same thing, except for this time, it's all this Hollywood stuff. You know, there's cameras and, and uh, all these 
different artifacts from like different sets and movies. Next. And this is at the Liberace Museum. And then here, of course, everything is either mirrored or, or, or glitter. So uh, uh, a, a lot of the work that was in that show was like made with glitter. So it kind of, in a way, it's like all the work disappeared or became like camouflage because everything was glittery and everything was shiny. So like, you, you know, it totally blended in. Next. And this was great. There was this weird place out in the desert outside of Vegas. And it was this, it's called Cathedral Canyon. And it was this canyon in the middle of nowhere that had all these grottos. And this, uh, it was sort of like a Christian sculpture park. And, and a long time ago, like someone went down there and put all these different saints in the niches. And then uh, it's really weird because the, the, the whole thing is like lit up with like candelabras and it's very strange. And then when I was out there, uh, the, the, the guy that ran it died and then it sort of became this like abandoned area but the lights still work, so you would go there at night and turn the lights on. It would be really weird down there. And then, uh, then somehow this local gun club found it. And they would go down there, and they would shoot all the saints out of the niches. So uh, uh, I took it as my job to like put them back. So I went to like thrift stores and junk, junk sales, and I got all these different saints and things. And I would try and put them back in there. And uh, sometimes they would last for months, or like sometimes I'd come down, down there the next day and they'd all be shot up, you know, like somebody went down there. Uh, next. And then this is the Cranberry Museum in Las Vegas. And no, nobody's quite sure why they have a Cranberry Museum in Las Vegas, but I thought it was really great. And. Uh, so I did this uh, cranberry theme show. And this is their mascot. It's like Karina the Cran Cran Girl. And uh, I, th I think that when they made it, they thought it was going to be cute, like a cute thing that like kids would like. But like I think it's like really horrific for children because it's like this big, horrible mouth with these teeth like right at eye level. OK, next. Uh, and this is the Cranberry Show, and basically, you know, it's, a, it's very funny because it's like, you know, every time that people go to Vegas, like, the first thing they think is, I want to go see a bunch of antique cranberry harvesting <laughs> implements, you know, so they have all these different buckets and things. And then here's the show, it's just kind of these things that are just like put in with all the cranberry artifacts. Okay, next. Uh, and then I moved to Sweden in, in, the, in the late 90s, and I kind of carried on the same Vegas idea, but in these like local Swedish museums. And I lived uh, way up north near the Arctic Circle in, in Umeå, Sweden, but there are a few museums around there. So this was the first one. It started this nautical museum, and it had this big tugboat that they constructed this special room for. And, uh, Nobody was sure why they had the tugboat. But uh, anyway, so I used that and did uh, invite these different artists to do installations in and on and in every single room and under the tugboat. All right, next. Uh, and then uh, this is something that maybe some people have heard of. It's the, it's the ice hotel that they make in, in, in northern Sweden. and. Uh, I wanted to do like some kind of show at the Ice Hotel. So instead of doing like a, a, a visual art show, I wanted to do like a performance festival. So I, I asked different artists, Swedish artists and some American artists. And sort of the uh, star of the show was uh, uh, Anne Magnuson. Oh, here she is again. Uh, and uh, she's famous for lots of different things. but. Maybe you've heard of, of the band Bong Water. She, she was the singer in Bong Water. And uh, she did this, did this uh, performance in, in uh, all the different rooms in the Ice Hotel. And she had this, saw this laundry line with these different blonde wigs. 
And then in every room, she put on a different blonde wig, and then she'd tell a story. Because uh, uh, her heritage is Swedish, but she had never been to Sweden before. So she was kind of like re reliving like her ancestral past in a way. OK, next. Uh, and then this was one of my favorite museums in Sweden. It's a, it's a dinosaur museum. Uh, and uh, it's run by this Christian group. And they have this theory that when God created Adam and Eve, he also created dinosaurs at the same time, except for they were friendly and they wouldn't eat you. So next slide. So I did this show there. Uh, that's, the outs that's the outside of it. Next. Uh, and it's a beautiful museum. It's like the inside of a cave. And uh, sort of the theme of this, theme of this show was, was to like, try and prove their theory that people were alive with dinosaurs. So this is some of the art that was in the show. Ne next. Uh, and this was a little, it's a little a photo cube. It's supposed to be like dinosaurs getting on Noah's Ark. OK, next. And that was a, a self-portrait of a Swedish artist, kind of this severed head in a jar that would bubble. Next. Uh, and this was a great piece. It was a, this huge display that actually covered an entire other display in the museum. And this is like the, the uh, history of giants from the Old Testament un, until the end of the world. Uh, next. Uh, and then now we're going to Mexico. Uh, well, I'm almost wrapping this up, if you can believe it. Uh, anyway, in Mexico, I learned about the Virgin of Guadalupe, which is very similar to the Shroud of Turin. It's like, it's like a miraculous stain image. But the thing that I found most intriguing that uh, people were doing research about her eyes. And they would get these photographs of her eyes, these blow-ups. And they would look in there thinking that they were seeing uh, these different faces reflected in the eyes. And this is kind of how, how it would work. Like if they put the lights up, and someone took a really good picture of me, like all of you would be reflected really tiny in my eye. So anyway, that's the theory. Next slide. So I got these photographs, uh, but I saw different things in them. Uh, let me try. I don't know why, but I saw a lot of Bigfoot. So you can see you can see it right there. Uh, there's Abraham Lincoln, you know, but you have to really look to see these things. Uh, there's Blinky if you if you look at this part. Uh, and there's a lot a lot of Elvises too. Next, and that's the other eye. Same thing, a lot of Bigfoots, Elvis, sort of, kind of like super villains and saints and everything mixed together. Mexican wrestlers. Uh, and then I was asked to be in this, in this show at, at Insight. It's like a border show in Tijuana and San Diego. And you could pick wherever you wanted to show. So I picked the, it's the Tijuana Wax Museum. And I did something that I thought was very simple. I just looked in the museum and figured out which figures that they didn't have that I thought they should have. And then added those to the display. So this is the uh, Virgin of Guadalupe. And it was done very seriously, very realistically. And uh, this was an interesting thing about this. I, I talked to the owner, of the owner of the museum later. And he said that uh, the, the people in, local people in uh, uh, Tijuana like, take the museum very seriously. And he actually saw people like, uh, 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 praying at the foot of the Guadalupe and, and adding little candles and things to it, like, just like a regular shrine. OK, next. And then they had this pit of hell, so, so I uh, put in a, uh, a Dante figure uh, leading through the way. And next. And of course, they had a Hall of Presidents, so I just had to put in Nixon. And it's at the moment that he's like caught with the Watergate tapes, and he's kind of pissed. OK, next slide. And this is where he was, in between uh, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, Fidel Castro, and Gorbachev. Kind of makes sense. All right, next slide. And now we enter into the wonderful world of Thomas Kincaid. Uh, uh, a few years back, I was, I was asked to curate a show on Thomas Kincaid. 
And this was going to be the first serious art world show of Thomas Kincaid's work. And uh, it was going to be shown down in uh, uh, Santa Ana. Anyway, when they, when they asked me to curate the show, I could do whatever I wanted. You know, I had total freedom. So uh, what I wanted to do, this was kind of the theme of the show, is I wanted to show everything that Thomas and Kate had ever made. And so that's not only his paintings, but that's like potholders, that's like coffee, that's little dolls, that's furniture, it's drapes, it's uh, toys, lazy boys. I mean, I don't think you can think of a thing on earth that doesn't have Thomas Kincaid on it. So next. So I had these different rooms, you know, where there was like a living room scene. And, has, and, uh, and it was actually in two galleries. This was another gallery that had, it had like a Christmas area and little, little villages back here and a dining room set next. Uh, and there was a Thomas Kincaid Chapel. It was a real chapel. I had the uh, Reverend Ethan Akers uh, doing sermons on Kincaid. And again, you know, it was, you know, it was serious, and I would come by, and I would see people praying in the chapel, which I thought was great. Okay, next. And then this was my favorite of all things. It's the Thomas Kincaid Lazy Boy. And I thought that's the, the one object that, you know, that really s speaks to me, the Lazy Boy. All right. And now we're wrapping things up, and now we're getting back to Blinky. And I just wanted to show you uh, a few relics from Blinky. So uh, this is a recreation of Blinky's co coffin. Uh, the, the, the first one was actually plastic, so this is like a sort of updated, better version. This is like, this is like a top-of-the-line uh, pet casket. Next. Uh, and these are some relics. This is Blinky's uh, original plastic bag. Next, uh, and that's a, one of the bones that was exhumed from Blinky, and this was put into a uh, 18th century Vatican reliquary. Next, uh, and that's uh, one of the wreaths from, from uh, the uh, re reburial of Blinky. Next, uh, and I did a, a you know, different series of headstones. Next, uh, and this is another little Fragment uh, of a bone of Blinky, another reliquary. Next. And uh, this is a Blinky crown. And this was like, from my research, I, I realized that the idea of the king's crown comes from the coxcomb uh, of a rooster. So I sort of added those, those two elements. All right, next. Uh, tried to make different folk art. This is Blinky uh, carved out of a coconut. Next. Uh, and getting back to the sh shrouds again, this is a, a blinky shroud. And this one was, a, it's not a real shroud. It was a, something I made later, you know. It was, it was a, a print. Okay, next. And these are from the video uh, that you know, shows you the process going from the blinky shroud to the next, to the Veronica's veil. Uh, next image. Okay, this is the this is the real shot of Blinky, and uh, how that was made was w when I when I did the original piece, I took Blinky out of the bag for a second to take photographs of Blinky, and put it on a piece of paper, and I didn't realize it, but at, when I lifted Blinky off, there was a print in blood of Blinky, and, and it was you know kind of like a miracle, like the shroud of Turin, so that that became the uh, uh, shot of Blinky. And next. And this is one of the last slides. Uh, this is kind of like the circular, uh, circular logic of Blinky. So you have the, sh the, the shroud. So you start with the drawing of Blinky, then you get the piece of meat, and then the Blinky from the Guadalupe eyes, and then the shroud, the Veronica's veil, different Veronica's veil, then the shroud of turn, uh, Elvis's sweaty handkerchiefs. And then uh, Marion Barry's napkin. And then you get these real Veronica's veils from like the Middle Ages. And if you look at them over time, they start to mutate into this weird kind of three-pronged tooth shape, which is exactly like Blinky from Pac-Man, the ghost image, and that goes back. So that's, that's the circular logic. Uh, and last slide. OK. And 
for any artists in the room, this is my theory about art, you know. You wonder why art is, is, is so hard to make. You know, you like trying to make art and the phone's always ringing or you have to take out the trash or do the dishes. And the reason why art is so hard to make is that the devil hates art. You know, he's trying to s stop you from, from that happening. Because the devil hates art because art is one of the few things that uplifts the soul and the devil can't have that. So that's the end of the lecture, and I'll be ready for a few questions. So we can turn up the lights. And uh, maybe I'll come down. Maybe you have some questions. We also have microphones for you to use as well. So if yeah, you, you can wait pass for those. those around. Question? There's, yes. When you exhumed Blinky, what did you find? Well, uh, at, at first I was really horrified because I was, I was kind of imagining Blinky as sort of this horrible mummy, kind of this crusty, kind of bony thing. But what I didn't realize is that the water table was so high that over the 10 years the, the casket had filled with mud. So I was like actually completely horrified when this thing thing came up because it wasn't what I expected. I actually got like really upset, you know, for days. I mean, it was. It, 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 I think with a lot of my art, it like starts off almost like a prank, and then over time it becomes real, even to me. And this is what happened: is like it became really real, and I got kind of freaked out. Well, okay, uh, uh, I took the bones to a, a, a doctor friend of mine, and he, he, he's really interesting because uh, he was the, if you think back, remember that biosphere that they locked the, the people in in the desert, you know? He was the doctor for the biosphere, so he's kind of this famous doctor. And he did the uh, autopsy on Blinky, and, he, and he, he found out basically that Blinky died of trauma. <laughs> Meaning that, you know, probably got her head cut off. <laughs> any more questions? We have one over here. Did you find any hidden numerology or anything or symbolism in the Kincaid uh, material? <laughs> yeah, it's really... Kincaid, I mean, people don't realize how weird Kincaid really is. I mean, you, you know, you think you have this idea, but I got to meet with them. Uh, many times, and uh, I, I think my theory about Kincaid is that he's sort of trapped in his own image, like he's he's trapped in being this kind of this goody good kind of Christian guy, and he sells all this stuff, but he really wants to be like an artist, and he really wants to be kind of a fuck up, but but he can't because he's making so much money that the people around him won't let him sort of express anything weird, so. When I was wor working with him, uh, he was having a really good time. You know, I could see that he really enjoyed the things that I was doing. But it's weird. It just gets really weird. Because there was a Kincaid, I read this in the newspaper today or online today, that he had done a Pinocchio print for Disney for like the 50th anniversary of Pinocchio, and there was... 23 letter ends for his wife's name and pictures of he, he and his wife and yeah sort of it's strange kind of, uh, uh, Shroud of Turin kind of stuff in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he always does that. I mean, he, uh, he puts in different letters for his wife's name and for his children's name. He also puts dates of their birthdays. Uh, he always uh, hides in sort of like Bible verses. And whenever he can, Whenever there's a group of people, he at least puts himself in, kind of like Hitchcock or his family. Also, on the, he did this like 50th anniversary of Disneyland, and in the crowd is him and his entire family. So yeah, he always hides uh, a lot of a lot of things in there. But they're so far they've been kind of like cutesy, like no one's found anything like really diabolical hidden in there. 
I wanted to continue on the Thomas Kincaid theme. I saw the show and I thought you did a brilliant job and Thanks. I was particularly taken with the the visa card that you oh, had yeah. and how you installed that. Yeah. But I also remember at the opening that there were protests outside oh, yeah. with police and I thought that that was such <laughs> a lovely element, how the students reacted to your doing the show there. Yeah, yeah, that was, that, that was like part of the fun because uh, especially the local artists in that area just hated the show. I mean, th they like thought it was like the doom and the gloom of the entire art world. It would, it would, it would be like if the hammer had a Kincaid show, people would go crazy. And uh, there were actually like death threats against Thomas Kincaid. People had called in and said that they were going to stone him. Uh, people said they were going to slash his original painting. So they had to hire like an armed guard. Uh, and yeah, people were going crazy, but that was, that was just part of the fun. Uh, more questions? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, kind of like how clowns uh, evolve from devils. Uh, I did a lot of research on Santa Claus and re realized that the Santa Claus figure evolves from this sort of this this forest wild man uh, that's that that in in, in the original sagas uh, sounds more like Bigfoot than Santa Claus. He's this hairy guy that lives in the jungle. Uh, lives in the forest, and he's kind of like dirty, covered with soot, and he's sort of stinky. And then over time, Santa becomes more and more cleaned up, and his clothes become white, his beard becomes white, and he becomes sort of more friendly uh, until we got the figure that we have now. But if you go back again to the, to the earliest recordings of these wild men figures, they're, they're these terrible, scary figures. Like They're like cannibals uh, and they just have these really uh, you know diabolical habits but it's kind of like in a way it's like what we do with all of our mythical figures is we like clean them up and make them really cute but they're but they come from these like horrific origins uh, yeah please yeah, uh, there's this weird thing that kind of happened with, with Santa Claus, is that uh, you have these like different lines of Santa Claus that started in different places, and they sort of converged. Like there's Saint Nicholas, which, which was like a real saint, and he, he was a saint from, from Turkey. And actually, he, he's very funny, too, because he, he also has these really kind of diabolical things that he did in the beginning. Uh, so you have sort of this, this Bigfoot creature, this wild man, uh, St. Nicholas, and, the, and, the, and at first they're, they're all totally different. And then over time they kind of they merge and, and congeal in a very strange way. More questions? One down here. Wait, I'm coming with the mic. Hi, just a general kind of question. Um, obviously, humor is, at least to me, a big part of, of what you do, and I think you're very successful at it. But is it a problem when people don't get you that you're not taken seriously as an artist? Yeah, I can, I can talk about humor for a second. Uh, and first, I'll give you my theory about humor. And it's kind of my world view. It's like I see that everything that happens in life uh, has different segments and and everything that happens has a, a humorous part like like even if you go to like a funeral it's like everybody's crying but something weird always happens there's always a humorous element even in like disasters th there's always something weird kind of paranormal that sort of makes no sense uh, and life is kind of like that life is not like you know one 100 percent serious 100 percent humorous or anything in the middle, like life is composed of all these different elements. So I kind of figure that with my art, if I took humor out, it would be like purposefully ripping apart uh, a part of life. So I always put humor in, and uh, I feel like humor uh, is like a doorway into my art. Uh, 
Because at first, oh, okay, at first it's funny, okay, and then you go, wait, oh, hey, wait a minute, no, there's, there's more to it, and then, then maybe it gets even scary later, but, but, but humor lets you enter in. Although, uh, it's kind of the, the, one of the few uh, taboos in art in, that I still uh, fight with. Uh, if you can believe it, humorous art is not taken seriously. Uh, we got one more, one more. Yeah. So, do you think the conceptual art movement uh, influenced? Oh yeah. Like <clears throat> yeah, and I can uh, actually sitting right behind you uh, was my teacher from uh, Pierce College, and <laughs> and and this is this is what happened was was actually it sort of it happened in reverse like when I was a kid. I would, I would do all these like pranks and all these like weird things that I didn't call it anything. I mean, I, I didn't put a title on it. I, I didn't even know it was art. I was just having a good time and, you know. Uh, and it was only later that looking back on it with the help of some of my teachers, uh, they said, hey, this sort of looks like conceptual art. <laughs> so I sort of put, it was a convenient title that I could put on a bunch of crazy stuff that seemed to fit and it was it was like the closest thing it was it was the closest title I could find but it sort of if it, it came on afterwards as a as opposed to oh, all gonna make conceptual art it was like no I'm doing weird stuff it's kind of like conceptual art question that time uh, and uh, I thought well I'll have a little gathering at my home for the evening and we call it a show and tell party Jeffrey brought a bureau drawer and one by one removed articles from his bureau drawer and had a group of neighbors enthralled until about one o'clock in the morning <laughs> talking about all these crazy little things uh, to wit uh, uh, getting a ride in the wiener mobile <laughs> with his friends, and then appearing at the Wienermobile's next stop, uh, waving hello. And he had to get to the hold of the schedule of the Wienermobile, a lot of surreptitious stuff. His hobby was doing things that people uh, doing uh, conceptual art in much more serious ways were pursuing year and year and uh, years after that. So in a way, he was like a, a predecessor of, of a lot of stuff that uh, became from. But that element of disarming, charming humor has always been part of what he does. And that's, uh, I think, what really sets him apart and uh, what keeps his art so youthful. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a great note to go out on. I hope you can all join us upstairs in the bookstore where Jeffrey's going to do a book signing. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks.